welcome to you all and thank you for your attendance on behalf of the Canadian Heart of Hearing Association Edmonton branch. My name is Cindy Gordon and I'm the project coordinator with CHA Edmonton. We have several of our board members and, and members here today, so welcome. Uh, we have our president, Lee Ramsdale. Want to give a wave over there, Lee? Lee has steerheaded this, uh, he was the main force behind this project here today. We are pleased to be working once again in partnership with the City of Edmonton, with whom we've actually built a pretty solid foundation. And again, our thanks to Rick Hansen Foundation for recognizing our project's worth. Cha Ed is part of a national organization. We have been in our city for more than 20 years. Hearing loss is the number one disability in Canada today. One in every eight citizens have hearing loss, and one in every two seniors over the age of 65. That works out to more than 100,000 Edmontonians that can benefit from loops. This is why we do these projects. We know how important understanding communication and being part of the community is. We hope that the information that you hear today and the technology that you have the opportunity to try and use will benefit you. I'd like to start before our guest speaker with a welcome from Rick Hansen. Hi, I'm Rick Hansen. Welcome to this special Access for All Canada 150 Awareness event. This is an exciting opportunity for all of us to come together to acknowledge and celebrate the great work that's been done to improve accessibility for your friends, neighbours and community members with disabilities. Did you know that nearly 4 million Canadian adults have some form of mobility, vision or hearing disability? That's 1 in 7 Canadians and that number is expected to more than double by 2036. As you know, one of the greatest barriers that people with disabilities still face are physical barriers in the built environment. You know, the places where we live, work, learn and play. Not having access to these common places and spaces means that people with disabilities aren't able to fully participate in life and our society can't fully benefit from the talents of people with disabilities either. And that's why the Rick Hansen Foundation is leaving a present for Canada's 150th birthday. With the support of the Government of Canada and communities like yours, we're breaking down barriers with the Access for All Canada 150 Signature Project. Access for All has funded 55 incredible barrier buster projects right across this entire country to improve accessibility and inclusion in schools, libraries, churches, theatres and recreation centres. These projects are removing physical barriers and helping create awareness about the importance of accessibility all across our great nation. So congratulations to the team of Barrier Busters who worked so hard to make this project happen. Your commitment and dedication to increasing accessibility and inclusion has brought us one step closer to a Canada that's accessible for all. Thank you and keep up the great work and let's never ever give up on the dream. Further to Rick Hansen, we also have an ambassador here from the Rick Hansen Foundation who would like to offer a few moments of reflect and uh, talk to us. On my right, we have Shauna Paisley Cooper. In July uh, of 2008, Shauna fell off her mountain bike and broke her neck, leaving her with a complete seasick quadriplegia. Shauna spent five and a half months in the hospital. She came home to a new home, not by choice, and it was devastating. She had to figure out how to be a mom, wife, and friend, paralyzed from a wheelchair. Shauna felt that her dreams were shattered and suffered from depression for a year and a half after returning home from her family. After beating her depression, Shauna has not looked back. Shauna is a stay-at-home mom right now, soccer mom, driving the girls to and from school, volunteering in school classrooms for the home reading program, on the fundraising committee for the school playground and coaches the girls' soccer team. She speaks to newly injured patients at the Glen Rose and she enjoys hand cycling, kayaking and camping with her family. Shauna believes in giving back to her community and volunteers for the SCI Alberta Adapted Adventure Sports Program. Her hobbies are knitting reality and live theatre. So welcome Shauna to say a few more words.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to be here representing the Rick Hansen Foundation. As you know, Rick is the CEO and founder of the Rick Hansen Foundation. He is a passionate advocate for people with disabilities in Canada around the world. I have a personal connection with Rick as we both have a spinal cord injury. When I was doing my rehab at the Glen Rose, Rick um, personally called me and gave me hope and inspiration that there is light on the other side of a, a tragic uh, injury. In honor of the 30th anniversary of the Rick Hansen Man in Motion World Tour and Canada's 150th birthday, the Rick Hansen Foundation is bringing together communities across Canada to take on a barrier buster project. The Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Grants help ensure that all members of our community have access to the built environment. The Canadian Heart of Hearing Association is a successful recipient of a Barrier Buster Grant. Here are some details about the project. They have installed audio frequency induction loop systems into the Heritage Room, the River Room, and Council Chambers. The Canadian Heart of Hearing Association Edmonton has attended many hearing conferences and worked with various professional organizations and individuals and have investigated all assisted listening technologies and have determined that the audio frequency induction loop system is the only system that gives us speech intelligibility. On behalf of the Rick Hansen Foundation, I congratulate the Canadian Heart of Hearing Association Edmonton branch for your outstanding Barrier Buster project. Thank you, Shauna. Without further ado, our esteemed guest, Dr. Juliet Sturkins, all the way from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. <laughs> Juliet was an audiologist with 30 years of experience in fitting of hearing instruments and counseling on a living well with hearing loss. Her retired engineer husband installed over 50 hearing loops locally to the benefit of her hard of hearing patients. She has become he heavily involved in the National Advocacy Campaign for wider use of hearing loops and for this purpose, maintains an informational website. I think you might share that later, right? Okay. In 2011, Juliet won the Hearing Loss Association Technology Access Award. And in 2011, she also won the Wisconsin's Audiologist of the Year. In 2013, she won the Academy of Audiology Leah Doffler Award. As of June 1st, 2014, she officially retired from private practice to devote all of her time, and I mean all of it, <laughs> to as the Hearing Loop Association of America's National Hearing Loop Advocate. Her focus is on education of consumers, audiologists, and hearing healthcare professionals. Having heard Juliet speak several, several times at, um, on this topic at different places, I think you're going to see her passion come through. I know she's enlightened us. So I'm really excited and happy for her to join us. Welcome. So I'm actually thrilled to be here. And I really appreciate because I think part of the grant paid for my travel to be here. But in effect, I'm a volunteer. Um, I'm um, only an audiologist. Um, who saw the light, and here's all my awards, you know, when you start doing things, you get recognition. I didn't know that. I'm not here to try and sell you anything, and I'm really here to enlighten you, to educate you about hearing loops and hearing loop technology, the difference it can make in a community, to people who are hard of hearing, their partners, um, the churches, the houses of worship that are wondering why people leave their churches, um, theaters who would like to see more bums in their seat. I'm not going to look at anybody, but I guess that's the term that theaters use uh, to get people sit down in their theaters. 
hopefully you will leave this meeting understanding what loops are, why they work so well, uh, why it's definitely a technology to stand behind. If you take away that hearing loops are like wheelchair ramps for people in wheelchairs, but for people who use hearing aids, then um, we've gone one step further. It's first of all raising the level of education and that's why I'm here. I generally start uh, a little to talk a little bit about hearing loss because if you don't have hearing loss or don't live with somebody with hearing loss, you may just kind of wonder, well, don't they wear hearing aids? Don't hearing aids take care of that? And so I'll kind of build that up, get to the point of why hearing loops are so helpful, so a little proof why hearing loops work, just a show of hands, so I know who's in the audience. How many of you use hearing aids or a cochlear implant? Okay. And how many of you live with somebody who wears hearing aids or a cochlear implant? Okay. So you're a daughter or a family member. Um, and how many of you have been told you ought to get your hearing tested? Generally, that's when a few guy hands go up. Yep. Somebody in the back. Are there any audiologists in the room? Okay, good. We can talk freely. Now, we're gonna, we're, they're going to be here later this afternoon. And some of the information that I'm going to be sharing is, of course, related to the American market, but that all extrapolates to the Canadian um, community as well. It's a very common birth defect. In the U.S., we see about 10,000 children that are born with hearing loss, so that would uh, be in this country at least 1,000 children every year born with significant hearing impairment. In the U.S., the estimates run about one out of every six to one out of every 10 Americans has some degree of hearing loss. I'm not saying one out of every six people needs to wear a hearing aid, but hearing loss tends to begin in our 30s and 40s and 50s, and then by 60s you can no longer ignore it for a lot of people. Um, it's the most or the, the third most common health condition for people over the age of 65. The other two are arthritis and high blood pressure. Those are the other two very common conditions, unfortunately, as we age. So people think hearing loss is just kind of a common part of aging, right? Um, and in the U.S., and I assume the same in Canada, is that the, the incidence is on the rise, meaning we're seeing that number of 35 or 40 million Americans increase because the baby boomers are coming. Actually, they're already here. You know, the oldest baby boomers are 70 or 71. Just because the country is aging, we're going to see more people who have hearing loss issues. This is interesting. Healthy aging and aging in place is less likely for people who have hearing loss. So is there anybody here who works in the retirement community business? Um, especially in nursing homes, you will see that the incidence of hearing loss is rather high because it becomes harder um, to take care of yourself and to hear a doctor's appointments and misunderstand when your hearing is on the increase. And it's also a condition that does not get a lot of sympathy. They can immediately see you're in a wheelchair, but you can't see that this woman is not responding to a joke, so then they think she's not with it. Well, she didn't hear the punchline, right? Or she didn't know somebody, well, you were asked something, but you were walking away. And when you walk away, you don't hear, right? And so now people think you're not with it. Or what is that with her? She's all stuck up. Right? But it's your hearing loss. Hearing loss is a very, it's a very different disability in that sense. And it's invisible and does not get a lot of sympathy. What do people tell you when you don't hear? Turn up your hearing aid, right? Like that's going to make a difference. For those of you who are not familiar with hearing loss, the most common complaint about hearing is not that the sound isn't loud enough but that the sound isn't clear enough, right? The distinction isn't there. The typical complaint is, I hear, but I don't understand. Why is that? That's because people with hearing loss hear something like this. High-pitched hearing loss affects 
the understanding of speech. And that I just removed all the high-pitched consonants out of that sentence, and now you have to kind of take your time to read. The, so people with hearing loss are constantly hearing like this. So they're constantly trying to fill in the gaps. They always laugh last at the jokes, right? Because they're still thinking about what it is that they heard exactly. So that's when this happens. Uh, the wife, of course, I'm sorry, I'm going to be picking on you guys, all right? But the wife says, I think you need a hearing test. And the husband says, why the heck do I need a hairy chest? <laughs> totally misunderstanding what she said. So you can imagine where this conversation goes, right? So then, why not just get a hearing aid? Doesn't that solve that problem? Hearing aids have come a long way, you know, and I was an audiologist in the late 70s when the hearing aids are analog and very basic or not very flexible in the adjustment. And there's probably people in the room who've used those hearing aids in the 60s and 70s. But, but, hearing aids are in effect microphones on people's ears. Okay, let me show you what happens when I move the microphone away. Does everybody, did everybody notice what happens when I move that microphone? And, and notice how it doesn't take very far. That's because this is a highly directional microphone that's, you know, that I'm holding at just the right distance because I, I have done a lot of public speaking. But hearing aids utilize microphones, and microphones have limitations. They pick up what's loudest, they pick up what's closest, and they don't know what it is that you want to hear. They're a microphone. So they tend to also pick up a lot of background noise. Number one complaint, my hearing aids make everything louder, including the background noise. All right? And then the distance, the effective range of most hearing aids is really two arm's lengths. So give me your arm. This is a pretty good effective range of a hearing aid. How many of you agree with that, who wears hearing aids? Yeah. And, this, and you know that you have to be in the range of your mom. Is it your mom? Um, because if you're too far away, she won't know that you're talking to her. So we expect hearing aids to give a person normal hearing, but they're not like eyeglasses. Okay? They make all sounds louder. And so where most hearing aids users complain the most are in places where there's reverberation. And there's a fair amount of reverb in this room. It bounces back at me. Where there's distance involved or time delays, and that happens in larger auditoria. And when there's background noise, people crinkling paper, people coughing, background noise coming from outside the hall, right? I'll tell you the truth. I had no idea how poorly my patients were hearing with the hearing aids I so carefully fit. I thought they were doing much better. And then when they complained, I would recommend new hearing aids because they were going to just solve all the world's problems. And they didn't, okay? Hearing aids just have limitations. It's not just a hearing aid. How many of you speak English as a second language? Ah, what's your primary language, Martha? What's your first language? What did... She's 104 months. You hold the record. The reason I bring this up, for those of you who speak English as a second language, we need a better speech signal in order to understand speech. Why? Because in our heart of hearts, we continue to process language with a different part of our brain. And not only that, this signal-to-noise ratio is a special test that audiologists do to measure how loud the speech has to be compared to the background noise to understand. And as we age, our ability to understand speech in noise 
decreases. That means that as we age, we need speech to be louder and more distinct in order to understand. So the example is you go to a noisy restaurant with a grandson and they hear okay across the table and you're sitting there doing the stretch of the ear, right? As we age, we need clearer and louder speech. And then if you have hearing loss, we need clearer and louder speech. So it's a double whammy. Um, and then if you have English as a second language, it's a third whammy. And I speak from experience because I grew up in the Netherlands. So to make that better, how can you make hearing better? You move closer. When you speak to somebody just a few inches from their ear, your voice is a hundred decibels. So you can communicate even with somebody without a hearing aid. Moving closer, but you can't do that in a meeting like this. I can't be at everybody's ear. Ask me to speak very, very loud. And that's when people with hearing aids go, not so loud, I'm not deaf. And that's because people who lose their hearing not only lose their ability to hear soft sounds, they can't tolerate the loud sounds. That's another whammy. So a lot of things work against people who use hearing aids. A PA system is critical, but to think that a PA system will give a person the very best hearing is not true when you use a hearing aid. So the third option to make hearing better is to use an assistive listening system. An ALS or hearing assistive technology, HAT, uh, what Lee so nicely called barrier-free hearing assistance. Now, there are different kinds of hearing listening systems. The first one is an FM system and it uses FM technology to broadcast audio to hearing aids, but then you got to pick up a listening device. How do you know you're not going to hear in the theater until the show starts? Right? The second system is infrared, and generally they're worn with a device under the ear with a, an eye that picks up the infrared signal. But you know what happens when you put your hand in front of that signal? It blocks the sound, so then you get static or crackling sound. And these two systems require the person who's hard of hearing to go pick something up. It's like her, somebody telling her, oh, just ring the doorbell and we'll put a wheelchair ramp out there for you. We got two guys, just wait, 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 in the rain. And then they come out with the wheelchair ramp and then you can walk into the building. So this kind of system is well intended. And it can be made to work. It's just not very convenient for people who are hard of hearing, or even worse yet. You go to a facility and you want to get in and there's no ramp. They say, we got four great guys and they'll carry you in. So the third system is a system that wirelessly sends the audio to hearing aids. And how do hearing loops work? Well. It's funny because this is very much the setup here. There's somebody, you need a microphone. So I'm speaking into the microphone. The sound is going into the microphone to a hearing loop amplifier. And that loop amplifier is sending a magnetic signal through an array of wires. And that's why they call it the loop. And the more common term has been as of late hearing loop rather than induction loop because no one knows what induction means. But a hearing loop, oh, it has something to do with hearing, right? So this hearing loop, which is under the carpeting in this facility, is creating a magnetic field. Think of ripples in the magnetic field that the telecoil in the hearing aid can pick up wirelessly. Why do hearing loops work so well, or why do consumers benefit so much from hearing loops? And that is that as the loop signal, my voice, gets carried through this wire that surrounds the audience, the telecoil picks up the sound wirelessly. In this process, this microphone 
becomes the microphone of your hearing aid. So it's like I'm talking eight inches from your ear. And that, of course, gives you very good clarity, very good understanding. And in the process, you don't get a whole lot of background noise. And so suddenly, people who have a lot of trouble understanding go, I can hear every word. That's usually the common thing that people will say. I can hear you lick your lips. Now, that may not be a big deal to you, but boy, when you can make somebody hear like that, it's just amazing. When I started doing this in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, it was jaw-dropping to my patients. It blew them away, and suddenly my pretty much laid-back Wisconsin patients got excited, and they started literally writing me letters and notes and emails, and they would call me, right? I love it, I love it. I mean, I can hear the minister lick his lip. This is a college professor who got laid to a meeting, and she said, I sat in the back, and I clicked on my T-coil, and I was like right next to the guy on the stage. I could hear every word. And then my patients kept telling me, they had never heard sermons, so a lot of pastors kept telling me, hoo hoo, now I can recycle my sermons, you know, because they never heard me the first time around. But this is somebody who's not even my patient, and he emailed me, he wanted the loop in his church, and I said, how did you hear of hearing loops? He experienced them in Florida. And then he wrote me this message, it's the greatest joy to hear in a hearing loop. So from an audiology point of view, it makes the hearing aids doubly useful. It allows people to participate again and to hear again in places where they never thought it would be possible. And unfortunately, the hearing industry has kind of perpetuated the myth that if you just get a new hearing aid, then you'll be able to hear. But the truth is that even with the very best of hearing aids, I can never give you the same hearing that you can get in a hearing loop. So what you need in a hearing loop is something called a telecoil. And by the way, they've been in hearing aids for like 60, 70 years, so they're not new. But what is new is that the telecoils have been greatly improved. They're tiny, tiny little copper coils that are either put in hearing aids or in little remote controls that some hearing aid users wear around their neck. They are in 100% of all the cochlear implants and on average about 70% of all hearing aids. So they're very common. And how do you know if you have a T-coil in your hearing aid? That is, if you have a button on your hearing aid or a button, that it's called a program button. It allows the hearing aid user to switch between different settings in the hearing aid. If you have a button, there's a pretty good chance that you have a T-coil in your hearing aid. But the audiologist doesn't always turn it on because it's the chicken and the egg thing. If there are no hearing loops, why would I turn on a telecoil? But if you don't have an activated telecoil, and you come to my church for a wedding, you couldn't turn it on even if you wanted to because it wasn't activated. And I found that once I started installing these loops, my husband actually did, and now there's all kinds of audio engineers who do, my patients started talking about telecoils. It became part of their vocabulary. Fascinating. But what if you don't own a hearing aid? Well, and I highly, highly encourage you to get up to the back and pick up a listening device if you haven't already done so, just to hear the difference. But this is a loop listener, and it has a T-coil built inside, and you just wear it with headphones. So yes, people who don't wear hearing aids would still have to pick up a device. But this is going to be new. And that is, these are headphones that have a T-coil built in, the headphone, that allow users of iPhones to hear in a loop. How many of you own an iPhone here? Ah, me too. Okay? So the cool thing is, those headphones, which run like 50 or $75, they're not cheap headphones, but they, and they work like 
all headphones do. You can listen to music, you make phone calls, but in a loop, you can turn that baby on to telecoil, and now you can hear in the loop. And there's some other developments coming with that technology. So that's very cool, because now everybody who walks in with an iPhone would have the capability of hearing in a loop. In a nutshell, hearing loops broadcast audio wirelessly to hearing aids via magnetic waves. You need a hearing aid or a cochlear implant, but the benefit is that the hearing aid and the implant customize the sound for the user. Headphones are generic, right? They're just making it louder and softer, but the hearing aid is programmed. It's like your wheelchair is fit for your body type, and it wouldn't fit somebody who is very tiny or somebody who's super tall. It has to be comfortable for you. So the hearing aids are fit for their degree and configuration of hearing loss, and the T-coil accommodates that. So you get very clear sound, and that uh, no need to pick up a separate device. They have their device already in their ear, and it's really barrier-free, universal access to sound, and the users can hear sound without background noise. So it's a huge, huge advantage. Are there people who have turned on their telecoil in the room and now are no longer able to hear what's going on around them? Okay. There are two different kinds of T-coil setting. One is where you have T-coil only. So all you're going to hear is me, and you won't hear nothing around you, which is great if all you want to hear is me, right? But if you also would like to hear who's sitting next to you, or if you're in a, in a meeting and you need to hear, you know, do a little sidebar thing, then you can have a setting called MT, which is your microphone stays on, and it mixes the sound with the loop signal, and now you can have it both ways. And the hearing aid industry is responding with apps on phones that allow the user on the fly to mix. I'm getting technical, but for some loop users, they don't like that all they hear is the loop and they can't hear their own voice. But there is a solution for that. Here's somebody listening with a loop listener in a waiting room because she doesn't wear hearing aids. I'm not going to belabor this very much, other to say that these hearing loops have to be installed to meet a certain standard, just like there are standards for ramps or bathroom stalls. They have to be so wide and to allow you to do donuts or wheelies or whatever they're called in, in a facility. Hearing loops have to meet a standard so that they sound clear, that there's no background noise in the system, that there's a very even frequency response. And that is why trained loop installers are a must. And there are several installers in this room who have experience with that. This is the universal symbol. You'll see a variety of configurations. But so if you're sitting there and you're not hearing a speaker and you, your mind starts to wander, oh, and this is a good place. You know, it's not quite in the front, but it's kind of where you have other things. And their eye will go, oh, they got a loop here. Turn their telecom. And I can tell you stories of my patients who've done that. They were at a Christmas gathering, and this gal said she couldn't hear a thing. And then she remembered she was in Oshkosh. She was my patient from a different community. And she tried her T-coil, and it just she blew her away. She wrote this absolutely wonderful letter. But that was because there was a logo. The logo was very small on the hymn board. So the T, as you guessed it, stands for T-coil or telecoil. In 2009, I started a small informative website, Loop Wisconsin. So if you're sitting here thinking, boy, my church needs this, right? I can help you with that. We've done this in hundreds of churches, advocated for loops, and I have all kinds of material. Um, but this happens to be my church in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. This is how they announce it. 
um, on a regular basis prior to services that start. Just to show you how loops can benefit people, this is a survey card that I dropped off at audiology offices around the community, and it came back to me in an unmarked envelope. I don't know who completed it, but somebody said, have you used a hearing loop? Yes. Where did you use it? St. Rafe. That's St. Raphael Church. That's my church. How well do you hear in that venue using your hearing aids only with no T-coil? Use the scale below where one means I hear nothing and 10 means I heard every word. This person says out of the loop they hear a two and in the loop they hear a nine. I mean, that is just huge. 866 people have completed a survey card like this, and the average is 4.9, and they jump to 8.7 in the loop. There's a study, if you're interested, Tara, there is a study um, that details all that information. I'd love to send it to you. This blew me away. But my patients kept telling me, I can hear every word, right? But what they were telling me is, I didn't hear before. You know, when you keep saying, I can hear you, I can hear you, that meant they weren't hearing you before. On my website, I keep a list of all the loops in Wisconsin, and honest, it started with one church. This is Appleton, Eau Claire. There's over 60 facilities in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, that have hearing loops installed, including the funeral home and the theater and the hospital meeting rooms, anywhere they use a PA system and a microphone and where the audience needs to hear. I've been able to kind of nudge facilities to, to move forward. But frequently, these nudges are now coming from experienced users, like people sitting in this room who say, we need this in our community room, we need this in our church, we need this at the business where I work. In Wisconsin, there's now loops at the Fireside Theater, that's the Grand Opera House. I mean, you may sitting, be sitting here thinking, well, who's going to pay for all of this, right? I gave a lecture at a Rotary Club, Afterwards, somebody came up to me and she said, I know they're remodeling the Oshkosh Grand Opera House. How much was it going to cost to put a loop in? And this woman plunked down the money. I paid for the loop drivers as a gift to the community, and she paid $10,000 to have the loop installed. So it's not a money issue. It's kind of a lack of information issue. This is the funeral chapel. This is the retirement community. They've had three or four loops installed since. And this is the largest performing arts center in the Midwest that has a loop installed, 2,200 seats. But you can also find loops here at pharmacy counters, at grocery checkouts, and you may wonder, where's the microphone, right? Because didn't I just say you need a microphone? If you look, there's the microphone. And so that microphone is highly directional, pointing at the person behind the checkout register. And this is the loop, and what that loop does, if you think of a loop being installed in a counter, it creates kind of a bubble. And where it's light green, it's a good field. This is a little weak field, but if the next checkout counter is right here, this person standing here is not going to hear what this checkout lady is saying. It's a very private system. It can work remarkably well. So this library has a loop, and it's the librarian who's hard of hearing. So she turns the microphone around and listens to the people across the table and just absolutely didn't know it was going to be that beneficial to her. Just really cool. But there's loops here. This is nothing new. They are been being installed around the world. They're also here. I don't know if you recognize this place. I'm a naturalized US citizen, and I don't really want to talk about that a whole lot. Other to say that I don't think they're listening to each other, unfortunately. They can hear the speaker. The loop is working that way, but they're not hearing each other. That's my philosophy there. Um, but there's interesting developments. Um, in the U.S., we have an ADA, the Act for Americans with Disabilities. And there is not a lot of teeth to that law, other than that consumers can file complaints. 
and somebody filed a complaint with Kinney Drugstore. This is a grocery store, but this is Kinney Drugstore. And the uh, attorney general in the state of New York ruled that Kinney Drug had to install a loop at every pharmacy counter. And that's what you're seeing right there. And if you need sign language, there's information here that they will also offer video sign language relay if you need to communicate that way. So these are some very interesting developments. Um, and this is Detroit Airport. I travel a lot and I always have to go there and take a picture. It's just my thing. They have installed hearing loops in some of the gates at Detroit Airport. Just to show you what's happened in Wisconsin, this is my husband, and that's about when he retired, a little bit later, crawling through churches to help my patients. Today, hearing loops look like this. I mean, there's over 600 hearing loops, over 300 churches. But the real reason it's happening is because hearing care providers around Wisconsin are educating their clients. They are talking about it, and then it's those clients who are taking information and advocating. So my goals, um, and, they, and they started very small, just in Oshkosh, and then they kind of grew into Wisconsin, and then I got offered grant funding to become the loop advocate for, Wisconsin, for the United States, but it's a really big country, and there's just one of me, so I need all of you. Uh, but the goal, of course, is we got to raise awareness for hearing loss. People can't look at your face. They don't expect you to be hard of hearing. You're young, you're beautiful. I mean, you can't be hard of hearing, right? And so I see more people wearing outrageous color hearing aids uh, or being in their face, hair up, purple hearing aids, um, because it, it, you can't change it. It is what it is. Um, and if we raise that awareness, we also raise more awareness for people who are hard of hearing. I'm very busy educating consumers and the professionals because the professionals are not hearing enough from the hearing aid industry that the telecoils and the hearing aids can work so well. So I'm, I'm working on that end. This applies to a lot of disabilities and a lot of handicaps, raising awareness, you know, let me get people to acknowledge the issue, encourage hearing aid use. And, and I think, but that's just my opinion, I think that part of the reason why only one out of every three or four people with hearing loss wears hearing aids is that they don't work in the places where they need them the most. So if we can guarantee places of better hearing, hearing aid usage will also increase. And that's good for audiologists, right? It's like buying a Porsche. Porsches are great, but you can still only go 55 miles an hour or whatever, 100K, but it's so nice once in a while to go 165, right? So hearing loops let you go 165. There are some drawbacks. Um, they can be more expensive to install, and it can be tricky sometimes to hide the wire where it needs to be. And occasionally there can be some interference, magnetic interference in a building that needs to be taken care of by an electrician. And this question, with the world going wireless, is Bluetooth going to replace telecoils anytime soon? And the answer is no, not at the moment. Um, do you remember the Jetsons? Anybody watch the Jetsons? How many thought that by the year 2000 we'd all be having jetpacks on our backs? Me, I watched the Jetsons in the Netherlands, all right? We still don't have jetpacks. So it's going to take a long time for this Bluetooth technology issue to be resolved. And if it gets resolved, and I really hope it does down the road, this gentleman who's going to be speaking next about his theater having installed a loop will gladly install a green tooth transmitter on his hearing loop system to accommodate the latest hearing aids over and above the hearing loop. But the hearing loop is universal, work, worlds, works the world over at the moment, is very low cost, doesn't cost any energy, and works with any make, model hearing aid as long as it has a T-coil. So it's going to be a while about cost, and these are US dollars, and I'm maybe going in a little bit too far, but if you do not have a loop for your TV, 
You can do that yourself for very little money. It makes a fantastic Christmas gift. And I have handouts on how to do that. Most churches, and, and these are US numbers, Midwest numbers, 3,500 to $6,000 for a church that has an, a basement underneath the sanctuary. It becomes a little bit more expensive if there is no basement. The size of the auditorium, the metal in the auditorium, and the effort to hide the wire will determine the cost of a hearing loop installation. But I've seen loop installations as much as $125,000. But elevators cost money too, right? And my church has spent $45,000, and you could not pry those three hearing loops out of that facility. I'm here in Edmonton also to educate providers, and this is a little bit of information for providers, and there are none in the room, but um, once ed providers are educated frequently, we can move hearing loops forward. This is a provider in Milwaukee who has a hearing loop installed in her waiting room so she can demonstrate it. And this applies to you as a consumer, okay? You have to speak up. you got to you got to bitch, all right? You got to complain. That's the only way you're going to make change. And it's okay. You have every right, just like Shauna has every right to get into a building with a wheelchair ramp, you have a right to be given an accommodation to hear. If they have no hearing loop, but they use FM systems, then ask for neck loops, because neck loops, when they're good neck loops, can make an FM system work well. Um, speak up when facilities are being built, when places are being remodeled, new carpeting gets installed. That's when hearing loops can be installed pretty easily. Um, speak up. I spoke up at a university that was under construction, a big building, and when the building was done, they had five hearing loops installed. Score. You know, and now the university is installing other hearing loops. Then it took one meeting. I was the only one there. What are you going to do for people who are hard of hearing? Oh, oh, we had never given that any thought. Join hands with CHA members. There is strength in numbers. And then this is a biggie. Letters of praise, letters to the editor, PR. I have all kinds of ideas. I, have, I blog on a website called uh, WordPress. It's called uh, Loop Wisconsin. It's all one word, Loop Wisconsin, it's on WordPress. And I have all kinds of blogs about PR, about how to get loops in churches, what you can do as a consumer, what one person can do. And if you don't see it there, email me. I'll help you. I mean, this is what, this is what they pay me the big bucks for, all right? Actually, they give you a really fancy title when they don't pay you anything, so that's kind of where I'm at. But I'm retired. Uh, my father could stand under a smoke alarm and not hear it. And he'd be so proud, and he would love to sit in this room if he were alive and turn on his telecoil. You know, he just never saw me work on this um, technology. But so everybody deserves to hear. I have a couple of handouts with me. This talks about that hearing, sur the surveys show that users prefer hearing loops. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, we're going to put an FM system. It's cheaper. Who decides? Are they going to carry her into the building or are they going to give her the means so she can drive in on her own? She deserves to decide that, not the audio guy. I have other handouts, how to get more from hearing aids and implants. I have this Let's Loop America's Worship Centers that works great. If you belong to a church, please take one. If they're gone, I have extras. And this is the gentleman who funds my outreach. He's a college professor. He's very hard of hearing. He just keeps encouraging me that you don't need everybody in the room. You just need the right people in the room. So you look like the right people in the room. And I very much appreciate your time and your attention today. And like I said, if there's anything that I can do, I have two different emails, jsturkins at new.rr.com or jsturkins at hearingloss.org. But I'm happy, absolutely happy to help you. Thank you so much. Okay, I hope that's got you all excited, and I hope you're having that opportunity to try 
the loop. Those of you who have no hearing loss, please get one to try. But what we'd like to do now is that we do have a panel of people here <clears throat> who have also installed loops or used loops or encouraged loops in Edmonton. And we're going to give them an opportunity to tell you where they have them and what change it's made for them or their business. And then the opportunity for you to ask them questions. We also have in the room uh, a person who installed the loops in this room. If anyone wants to ask Paul, he's at the back, you certainly can. But I'd like to introduce the people on the panel to you, starting at my very far left with Heather Crow. She joined the city of Edmonton in 2007 as the special needs recreation liaison. In 2013, Heather transitioned into the role of Accessibility Services Officer. Wow, what a name. Where she became the liaison for the City of Edmonton and the Accessibility Advisory Committee. So any projects that are coming through, any, any issues, Heather would have to be the one we have to talk to. So I've been working very closely with Heather for ma many years. So she advocates for additional, uh, the addition of the hearing loops in this building. And at the City Tower, City of Edmonton Tower has every second teller that has a hearing loop. It's really quite amazing. They have several rooms that have it. It's quite great. And it's all on account of Heather pushing that button for us. So it is who you know. In the middle there, sitting, David Flanagan is also with the city. He's a supervisor of technical advisors and training sustainable development. He's a building safety code officer with the city of Edmonton. His carpentry and business background combined with codes knowledge serves him a great team of inspectors. Plans, examines, support staff, other city departments, and more importantly, the public with technical advice and training. He's also a loop advocate. So we're very fortunate to have David with us. And lastly, but certainly not least, is Richard Hatfield, which we've met and worked with several times over the past years now. He's the current technical director of the Walter Dell Theatre. He became the technical director with a team of three others in 2010. In 2013, the Edmonton Accessibilities Advisory Committee, which is part of Leslie Tansy, who's also in the room, and Heather, they go around and they access buildings and give them suggestions on how to make them more accommodating. And so they went to the Walterdale and gave them some um, advice, and Richard took it to heart. So in the fall of 2014, a loop was installed. And they were the very first theater in Canada to have a looped facility. <clears throat> So many of us have been able to go back to the theatre. If you haven't used it, I encourage you to. It's amazing to go back to live theatre and watch it. So I'm going to turn the mic over to these people to say a few words. As I said uh, numerous times over the years, the advent of the hearing loop at Walterdale was actually as a result of that review that the Accessibility uh, Committee did for us, and then uh, subsequently a discussion with Lee as well as uh, Jim uh, to talk about the various options that we had. Once we discussed the various options, and I went and did a bunch of research, uh, did a whole lot of searching around online and, and just talked with a few other people, it became pretty apparent that if you're going to do it, you may as well do it right. If you're going to put a hearing assistance system in, if you go with a system that's not going to support the people who actually need it, what are you doing? Why are you bothering? Don't spend the money if you're just going to do something that's not going to support the people that you're trying to support. And so once I did the install, much, much to my surprise, we immediately started getting some very positive feedback. Uh, we've had some really, really cool letters as well as uh, now all of a sudden we've started getting a few awards and stuff and it's like, wow, okay. Uh, the Rick Hansen's uh, uh, Circle of Excellence Award was the last one, which I thought was holy crap, because I got a call from Heather uh, this spring saying, 
oh, we, we put your name forward, your theater's name forward for this award. You're okay with that, right? <laughs> I was, okay. <laughs> it's actually really cool because it allows me to see firsthand the impact that this decision to go with this loop has had and just how it's actually enhancing people's ability to enjoy theater because quite frankly I've I've been with Walterdale now for um, many years I was started there my first show was in 1991 I've been a theater junkie ever since I couldn't imagine my life without theater to imagine that someone who had been going to theater for a long time suddenly couldn't go to theater because of the issues uh, that were brought up now all of a sudden you're sitting here going okay well what am I doing I'll just go home I'll sit there do whatever now all of a sudden you can't do theater I can't even fathom that so as soon as I got the feedback from a few of the people one uh, woman who had stopped coming to the Walterdale uh, probably 10 years earlier she came back to the Walterdale for the first time in 10 years and she heard the show perfectly. I was amazed because she literally came up to me after the show because it was opening night and gave me a hug. <laughs> I'm like, wow, okay. We did have some interesting issues. Who would have thought that a flute would overpower everything in our freaking system? It did. <laughs> Because just like with a hearing aid, we have microphones that are uh, set up in, a, in special locations around our stage so that essentially we pick up the audio coming from the stage and we feed that into the loop. The flute overpowered the entire freaking thing. Who would have thought? So we've had to do some enhancements after the fact to kind of reduce certain frequencies that were problematic. My name is David Flanagan. Basically, I'm a building inspector. And before buildings are built, Plans are submitted to our office. Plans are reviewed. It is astonishing to me still now, more, well more than 10 years after starting this particular job that I do, that so many designers actually forget to consider this perspective, the building code. It's an understandable sort of thing has led to the, you, know, the, you needing to have to do your work and the fact that you actually got advised by Heather and reminded that there's a place for it. If I were to draw up this big book here, which I'll do to demonstrate. This is one half of the Alberta Building Code. Inside this code, I can dig through all of these pages in this very fine print all the way. I can go through and through and through to demonstrate that hidden here at the very back of the section that's called for accessibility, there is precisely two sentences to do with assisted, assistive uh, listening devices. Two short sentences. One of them does push us toward uh, providing assistive devices in assembly places, places of assembly. And you might find that interesting without getting technical, because you're you know, being careful not to be too technical here. And that is that this is actually an amendment from the National Building Code, which is the parent document to the Alberta Building Code, where it actually limits assembly places to classrooms and auditoriums. In Alberta, we saw the need to say places of assembly or assembly places, and it wasn't defined as being the entire building that way, but any hall or any space where people would be gathering. So that then reduces to a waiting room in a hospital if we were building hospitals today. Now, and that's the sort of provision that should be made. But it is hard for an inspector or for a plans examiner to actually see these items. I can't see whether the loop was built or not at time of inspection. So we really do rely on professionals to uh, build and to have functioning properly what's in there. As your call to arms was to speak up, if you are in places and new places, because we cannot uh, apply, apply the code retroactively, but in new places and you see that the provisions aren't apparent in places where people might be gathering, then our office welcomes uh, an inquiry back, simply dialing 311 or going online or coming down to our shiny new offices that has the T-coil provisions as well as in many meeting rooms. We are obligated to look into it. 
So we do welcome feedback from people. But this is where we start. This is the law. And we're really fortunate to have Heather, who is in a position to take it further than just the minimum that the law provides for here. The awareness is being raised all the time. In what way? In what way? Inside our office. I can only speak for the city of Edmonton. It is being raised that way. And that's why I say, again, I do invite that if, if there's a, a miss somewhere, then uh, that we want to hear about it. As I say, in buildings where this sort of installation would occur, there's a raft of professionals involved. There's electrical engineer, there's an architect, and so on. The complexity of those buildings leads that our involvement is less and the professional's involvement is so much more. Awareness raising like this or the next session where we'll have professionals in the room are very valuable. There exists a barrier-free sub-council to the Safety Codes Council. The Safety Codes Council, for those who might not know, is an arm's length organization of the provincial government that administers all of the codes, not just the building code, but all of the codes. There are sub-councils, as they're called, which are groups of interested and specialized persons dealing, say, with gas code or plumbing, or in this case, building. But accessibility is an interesting creature of, of which this assistive listening question is just part of it. But it's, an, it's a curious creature because it actually crosses the boundaries between certain of the disciplines. There's a discipline for elevators, and that has a barrier-free perspective to it. There's, a, there's the discipline of building, much barrier-free perspective. Plumbing, even, there's a barrier-free perspective to it. So they, they have a sub-council. I know that, that sub-council would welcome any public inquiries. I don't know if Lee is still on the... Say, Lee is on the sub-council. I was formerly on it. I have aged out of that council, so I'm not there anymore. But Lee would receive any inquiries, brings them forward to the council. And that would be principally to do with policies, policies that then maybe affect code, or can be seen that training needs to be sharpened. Then that feedback goes to the, the Safety Codes Council, who would then make directives of some sort because they're responsible for the standards of all of the inspectorate throughout the province. Long answer, sorry, but it is that complicated to make a change of any sort. So I'm Heather Crow with the City of Edmonton. One of the ways in which I got involved with this was through our Accessibility Advisory Committee. So that's a committee of volunteers that advises City Council. One of the main roles of that committee is to be the voice of Edmontonians with disabilities. The group does a lot of community engagement to try and find out what those needs might be and what we should be giving advice on. Our relationship with the Canadian Heart of Association, um, Edmonton branch in, in particular, has been key um, as we don't know what we don't know. It was wonderful for them to bring this forward to us. We had a great presentation where we actually got to test it out and listen to the loop system. Um, so for us to hear about these new technologies, um, once we're aware of them, we're happy to sort of um, keep promoting them where we can in the city. And like David said, um, I'm able to uh, use some funding internally to go back and do retrofits to some of our buildings. So that's how we've been able to add in the loop system to somewhere like City Hall. We have different challenges in different spaces. So luckily in this room we had carpet tiles on the floor. Um, so it was quite easy to lift up and put the loop system underneath. Um, but in other buildings it is much easier to do from the beginning. Um, from the get-go before the building's built. So that's one of the things I'm really trying to work on is to make sure that it's included in our new buildings, um, but then where possible, go back and do some retrofits where we can. Um, one of the other places we did add them into the city was to every City of Edmonton Recreation Center to the front counter. So um, that was a pretty easy fix for us to go back and do. So I'd say to other um, private organizations and other municipalities, um, there's a lot of quick wins and easy wins, and there's a lot of things you can do to plan ahead in the future. So. Um, and then I'd also just echo what Juliet said around praise, um, because one of the questions I keep getting asked from different departments in the city 
is are people using this? So we're putting this in and how do we know if people like it? How powerful one citizen can be and one complaint or one um, person praising what we've done. So I think just a call out to everyone to say um, if you've used it in one of our City of Edmonton buildings and you've liked it, please let us know through 311. Um, if you'd like to see it in another City of Edmonton building, let us know through 311. It really helps to have it documented and recorded. And I think having the voices of the citizens themselves um, will drive this and will um, move it a lot farther than just myself. So. Okay, some interesting food for thought. Actually, I was going to make that comment, Heather. All of you today who have benefited from this loop can send those comments to Heather so that we can let them know we are using it and if you're using it in any of the other city buildings because city of Edmonton should lead the way and they are leading the way. So we need to make acknowledgement. So now, does anyone have questions for our panel that they have not been able to get answered today or still questionable about? Francis? Just one question that I guess is going to be for Heather. In the city of Edmonton this year, we just had about 11 or 13 brand new schools open up. Is the city of Golden Rose or is that provincial? Because I would lay odds that none of them have any form of accommodation. She's wondering if the schools are part of or under the city's by standards. David? Those schools would have been built under, under uh, uh, brand new building permits. And so the assistive listening device regulation should have applied to that. Now, I didn't read the whole of that short little sentence there. What it talks about are assembly places exceeding 100 square meters, which is about 1,100 and some square feet. So I don't know how big this room is, but it barely makes that standard. So if you can imagine that this room, by our building code, if it didn't exceed 100 square meters, would not require any kind of treatment that way. So most classrooms would not have that. Larger room, you would suggest the gymnasium would. The response we often get from designers <laughs> is that they don't believe that there'll be enough people in the age group using the building that it would be worthwhile, and so they offer an alternative. They don't just say nothing, because they have to make some provision in some way. So they will use the, uh, the other device, the FM device, which we, I even have had the conversation with them where I say, really, then you, you, do you also give them a tall, pointy hat? You know, so all their, colleague, all their little friends, you know, know that they, 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 they're using this. That kind of thing. Sometimes you can move it, but sometimes you can't. We had, or just opening now, a post-secondary uh, construction. Really nice. We had the same kind of conversation. And to get them to put the loop in the, in the floor versus just having available a portable FM system was just an argument that in the end, if I don't have anything more here and the, and the people who are proposing the project won't carry it further than that, we really don't have any power from, a, from, the, from the building code point of view. Building code is absolute minimum standard. When we have a, a community that believes that it's climbed Mount Everest in their bare feet, simply by achieving what the minimum requirement is here and not exceeding that, it, we know we have a little ways to go on this topic. That, that would be the answer, would be um, that probably not too many rooms are big enough and there probably is some provision locked away in the closet waiting for someone to figure out how to use it. One other thing as well is, is, and I've got personal experience with this recently, is that if the consultants who are working on a particular uh, project don't see the benefit of it because they're not people with hearing loss and they don't understand, and, and I as well do not have hearing loss. I'm one of the lucky few who uh, has made it to my age without any issues so far. Realistically, I, through my experiences with uh, the Walterdale and with the uh, working with Lee and the other members of the Canadian Heart of Hearing, I did get that understanding. And I actually uh, worked with this other organization to try to get them to install a loop. At the end of the day, their consultants uh, basically looked at them and said, yeah, you don't need that shit, excuse the language, but uh, they basically said, eh, Go with the cheap stuff. That'll work. 
The problem is, it doesn't work. <laughs> so so it, it's ultra frustrating for people like me, who's, who I am a techno nerd, and I, I do understand a lot of the technology stuff of it. And sure, it will work, but we need to get buy-in and we need to educate everyone who is uh, going to be making the decisions in the projects, and that includes and starts, quite frankly, with the consultants who are making the recommendations. Is there funding, or will there be funding at some point in time for um, larger facilities? I can just say the ones that I'm aware of, but there aren't a lot that come by my desk. Um, I know that there's, well, we got the Barrier Buster Fund from Rick Hansen and put the loops in in these rooms in City Hall. There's the Enabling Accessibility Fund through the federal government, um, and then each municipality may or may not have their own funding. So the City of Edmonton does have funding um, to do retrofits, but it's only to City of Edmonton owned and occupied buildings. My experience with funding, a lot of it is in private, um, like houses of worship or churches. We had one church that was looped in Oshkosh, and um, I would send all my patients to Calvary Lutheran. But I'm not Lutheran. I don't care. It's Lent. Go to your Lenten service at Calvary. Go sit in the back. And then two weeks later, they'd come back, and that's all they wanted to talk about. How do I get it in my church? And so... There's a variety of ways, but um, earmarked donations, if you belong to a house of worship, you earmark your annual or weekly or monthly donation as for the hearing loop only. And in some communities, within six months or a year, they had enough funding to do so. Um, some Rotary, Lions, Kiwanis, um, non-profit, com community-minded organizations do. And then I usually recommend not to donate the full amount. Let's say uh, the Rotary Club is willing to donate $5,000. Somebody does an appeal, you do a lecture, you talk. You can have my slides. If, if you want my slides, you know, you can give this lecture. And then they'll say, well, we'll donate $5,000. Don't make it all out to one organization. Give five $1,000 grants that can help nudge uh, facilities forward. And, and I'm kind of looking over at Shauna because Rick Hansen could do some world of good for people who are hard of hearing. And that doesn't mean you have to pay for a loop in every facility. You need to kind of get to a tipping point, And then other facilities will see the light and start funding it. See, and one other thing, uh, as technical director at my theater, it's about prioritizing your expenditures. Uh, I have a budget that I put forward every year. When I decided after the, uh, the meeting at uh, the Glen Rose with the Canadian Heart of Hearing, where basically I mentioned that I was installing the loop and it felt like I had just handed a check out for a million dollars to everyone in the room. That's the positive response I got almost immediately when I said that. I was originally, it's like, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll install the loop, it'll get some bums and seats, woohoo. But there was no real drive at that point. But after that meeting, I made it a priority in my budget the next year. Sure, we went after grant money, but I didn't care. So I didn't get a couple of extra toys that year. Instead, we got a loop. So we didn't spend the money on a couple of extra lights that we had originally in our five-year plan accommodated for. I went back to my tech team and said, screw the lights, we're buying a loop. If we can get the organizations to prioritize and make it a priority, the problem is, is that they've got all this money and they want to buy these toys, they're not prioritizing the toys are more uh, important to them than this, which, quite frankly, is way more important to you guys. Yes, we have some loops in Medicine Hat. We'd like to have some more. The challenge is, for most of our facilities, they're multi-purpose. And so they would be used for a meeting like this, which is fairly easy. But they would also be used for things like an arts um, reception or for um, some kind of musical performance, and they will have zero tech support after the day they're, they're set up. So the issues with the flute, we will never have resolved. So I'm just wondering how we deal with that in a multi-purpose facility. This is 
a question for a, a good technical loop installer. There are a couple in this room. Paul is one of them, and right behind you are two gentlemen from Calgary area. They are going to be able to advise you, and trustworthy loop installers are also key to this whole project. Obviously, you can if you don't have loop installers who will do the right thing, um, and so I have a handout on how to buy a hearing loop on my website. And if you don't, can't find it, it's on the home page, Loop Wisconsin, kind of towards the middle, how to procure a hearing loop. And you'll learn a lot just from reading that document. Could you repeat again how a person can get it changed? The code. I, I might uh, say, having sat on the Barrier Free for the Safety Code Council, that information has to get to the Barrier Free Council first. It starts with complaints. It starts with the complaints, and, but you have to tell council members so council members can bring it up for the changes. But a complaint alone in a letter doesn't end in a question mark, so no one's obligated to talk back to you. Always take your comments, complaints, whatever you like to say, but, but put in questions so that someone has to get engaged with you to start to answer the questions. And for every answer, you can always find another question. And for every question, you'll get another answer and you get the ball rolling. And personally, I've had success that way. When I've had issues, I, I, I want it answered by authorities. And it, it can work. All of us, Heather, I, if I receive an email or a letter that has a question in it, I'm obligated to answer the question or I'm subject to some slapping boat by the people behind the wall here who run the place. I think that's the way you really want to go about it. Okay, actually changing a code straight from dead stop. There's a form on the National Research Council website, but I think that you don't have enough days in the week and, and months in the year to have that really make any effect. You need to sway opinion, and when the numbers start to speak, then people start looking at policy again, recognizing the society is changing. The mentioned it was the aging in place thing. And that. so that's a big topic from society resource point of view. We don't have enough homes for people, you know, and if they could stay in their own home and have better lives and so on, you know, not directly related to this necessarily, but that idea. Once you start to move with a group of people and the numbers start to count up, then the people who make decisions do listen. So on behalf of Chaw Edmonton, I'd like to thank all of you who participated and Juliet from coming all the way from Wisconsin. And, of course, the audience for coming out and listening as well. Thanks again to uh, Shauna for speaking from the Rick Hansen Foundation and the Rick Hansen Foundation for sponsoring this and to our caterers and to Shannon we providing our um, other access, which we love, our captioning. If you, as you leave, want more information, we have all kinds of stuff back there. We have memberships. And like Juliet said, we need... A bigger voice, we need more members, and that's how we'll make a change. So thank you all very much for coming.